SOHIC must. The Students One Health Innovation Club, Barara University of Science and Technology, presents the power of their story. A documentary film about Ugandan folk in the wake of the novel COVID-19 pandemic. Warm greetings from Bara University of Science and Technology. And my name is Catherine Achaire, a lecturer at Bara University of Science and Technology. Coronavirus disease 2019 started in China, but is now a pandemic with millions of people infected and thousands killed. In order to mitigate the effects of this disease and several other pandemics, there is need for a multi-sectoral approach that utilizes knowledge and skills from different spheres of training. One such approach is the One Health. One Health approach enables students to understand and appreciate contributions from different disciplines outside their own in order to predict, detect, and respond to public health challenges that we are facing today. Africa One Health University Network, Afrohon, formerly One Health Central and East Africa, strongly advocates for such approaches of training in universities in a bid to develop a workforce without disciplinary barriers working in tandem. This has been fully embraced by Mbara University through the SOFIC Mass Chapter, and I am the patron of this club. In this documentary, we explored experiences from Mbara community during the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope you enjoy. I am Mariam Ichilet Arikosi. The Students One Health Innovation Club was officially launched on 19th October 2018 with over 200 students from the different faculties at Mbara University of Science and Technology. We have greatly grown since then. We were founded on the One Health Principle, which is the collaborative effort of multiple disciplines working together locally, nationally, and globally to achieve optimal health for animals, humans, plants, and the entire ecosystem as they are intrinsically linked. As the global community is racing to slow down and eventually halt the spread of COVID-19, which has claimed over 500,000 lives and infected over 10 million people, the Students One Health Innovation Club deemed it fit to join this global fight. So must organize a response against COVID-19 with two objectives. One, to raise awareness about accurate COVID-19 information, and two, to support the implementation of the public health interventions as guided by the Uganda National Health Task Force and the World Health Organization. Once a national state of emergency was declared in Uganda, over 21 health students in Barara have volunteered in Barara General Referral Hospital to support the COVID-19 task force here. To flag off the SOHIC mass response, we organized an online webinar which trained several international students from Uganda, Kenya, India, and several other countries. We equally organized a needs assessment in three different areas, Rory Corner Market, Central Market, and Tasso Village, which is a student's hub to assess the gaps in knowledge, attitudes, perceptions about COVID-19. Following the assessment of the survey, the gaps found were used to influence and inform the community dissemination program, which took place in Rory Corner Market, Central Market, and Tasso Village. Here, we answered questions that the community had raised posters about COVID-19 in both English and Runyankole. At the same time, we donated a no-touch hand washing system, which was an innovation of one of our own, Turia Musime Rogers. And in this innovation, it has a pedal system which does not require users to touch the tap. This is all to support the implementation of public health measures. All this was picked with this documentary, The Power of Their Story. I was the first focal person for SHARE in this institution, and we are honestly very grateful to the overall leadership of, of SHARE, and now Afro Hoon, um, uh, and uh, Professor Bazeo of Makere. When One Health was introduced to MAST, one of our 
main objectives was to see how this concept would be institutionalized within Mbarra University. And so we began with activities that were, you know, were leading us to that overall goal. We introduced the concept to the members of staff, both academic and academic. We held some trainings to make sure that people have an idea of what One Health is. We had uh, mentors from Makere and also some local faculty who are experts in the area of One Health. And from then, um, expansion began happening. We got students uh, you know, who went out to the communities for placement, uh, particularly to undertake One Health activities. And, uh, over the years, we have also had um, faculty uh, leadership support. We've had university leadership support from the vice chancellor level to the different faculties. And as I speak now, the concept of One Health is, uh, you know, is within all the faculties. The Students' Health and Innovation Club has been able to do wonders. They've taken on this One Health concept with a lot of vigor. They've organized themselves. So we are very delighted about the new energy that has come in. Afrohun has continued to support MAST in different activities. As I speak now, everyone has got a contribution to this uh, monster of help. I am uh, Professor Celestino Obua. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Barra University of Science and Technology. Professor Obua, how has the pandemic affected traditional methods of learning and the university as a whole? For the education sector, uh, you can be sure that um, most of our uh, academic institutions were not designed for social distancing, and yet the effective tool to handle uh, COVID-19 is social distancing. Uh, of course, the other barrier protections like wearing the mask and uh, sanitizing the hands, washing the hands with soap and water is in addition to the social distancing. The important thing is not to be in contact with each other. Now, as such, you realize that uh, most of our education uh, system and environment was designed for close interaction. Uh, lecture rooms are uh, by nature crowded. The, the students are, you know, human beings and social animals, so they love to interact with each other. Now, COVID-19 unfortunately dictates that the exact opposite happens. So it has affected the traditional methods of teaching, which relied on face-to-face -face interaction uh, with the lecturer and the students. And now, many of the institutions have to adapt to uh, distance learning mechanisms, which is either purely online or a blended, where there is some level of uh, limited interaction, but also largely in distance learning. So, so that is how COVID has affected. We are not able to deliver the traditional teaching because of the need to socially distance and the need to being on board new infrastructure which we never had before. Indeed, yes, universities did have learning management systems, but learning management systems were not entirely designed to take over all the learning. We have in the university, there are areas where which require physical interaction, like practicals. So you cannot do practicals online. You need to be able to carry out these activities uh, in physical presence. The students need to be in the lab to carry out the activities together. Mm. Take for example in where we train health professionals. Yeah. You are supposed to be training them on patients. So there is no way you can do online uh, training for a young doctor to be able to carry out surgery. So amidst all those challenges that you have been aware of, what interventions are you putting in place and have you already put in place to ensure that come rain or shine with COVID-19 or not, we continue studying because education is a human right. Right, precisely. Uh, indeed, education is a human, human rights issue, mm -hmm. which, which I entirely want to agree with you. But at the same time, we also must recognize the fact that probably COVID is come, it has come to stay. So that's a reality we cannot uh, downplay. Mm -hmm. We have to be sure that it's whatever yeah. remedies we are putting in place, we have to be cognizant of the fact that COVID is probably going to stay. The other disappointing thing is that 
the current science has known about COVID is that probably you do not get permanent immunity. So that means even if we are looking forward to vaccines to, to, to come in place, mm -hmm. probably vaccines will only temporarily stave off infection, but that you can still be reinfected. Mm -hmm. so, so that is an issue. So what have we done uh, currently? So we are trying to address several issues, several factors. One, as I talked about the learning management system that is in place, mm -hmm. is for us to retool our teachers to want to appreciate the fact that the, the, the system is in place. Two, to accept to use the system mm -hmm. which is in place. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, secondly, we need to retool the students to understand that following the SOPs mm -hmm. for us to live with, with uh, within this um, uh, COVID, I mean, um, pandemic environment. It's going to require all of us to change our attitude and practice. So if you are told, wash your hands, wear your mask, and, and do ABCD, we must do it religiously. So we are hoping that with time, we transform our curriculum uh, online delivery system. Mm -hmm. So that is one. Two, we also want you students to be able to, to, to acquaint yourself with the learning management system. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you learn within that environment? for you as students. Mm -hmm. and, and that is very important because we, we want the students and the lecturer to work together. Mm -hmm. Nobody should be left behind. Left behind. Mm -hmm. The challenge with this transformation is that of technology. While we may have a system to put in place, we may have a server in which we shall be able to upload this program. What we may not be able to encounter immediately is, can our learners get, have the tools to access these materials as and when they need it? As and when they need it means, do they have the internet connectivity that will enable them to be able to learn when they want to learn? This is a challenge nationwide. It is not only from our university. It's, it's every university is grappling with that. Even for those universities who say, oh, we are ready to start online. And <laughs> the question you ask them, are your students ready? All of them. For mm -hmm. All of them. And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. so, you, so that is something that we need to do together. Mm -hmm. We are going to have to ask students and their parents mm -hmm. to budget for electronic uh, gadgets, mm -hmm. computers, mm -hmm. so that they can enhance the learning of the student. Mm -hmm. For Somebody to say government should buy it, I think that is now going to be a bit of a challenge. It is going to be difficult. My name is uh, Dr. Gadu Zaza. So over the years we've built Marine University as University Without Wars, University that interfaces real time with the challenges of the community. We've done this through uh, ensuring the students spend part of their time and they need uh, hard to reach underserved communities, most particularly in southwestern Uganda. Dr. Gad, during the novel COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen students' uh, input being sidelined. What would be your remarks on how the resource that students give, the energy and the enthusiasm can be used to respond favorably to this pandemic? Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with a remark that many people underrate that knowledge is power. And uh, students have a lot of knowledge, of energy, they even have time. Also, the current students are ICT, so they can use their social networks to push the message both, both near and far. The other issue is that younger people have that chance of providing age-specific, timely information to their peers and also to their young ones. In that way, you really students are an underutilized resource. Some initiatives have been tried. Uh, so students can provide information. Students can design uh, also animation. Students can design posters. Students can use their social network to provide uh, and reinforce messages around specific disease prevention. And uh, now we are talking about uh, COVID-19. So it's uh, that the few initiatives that students have started, there should be effort to further reinforce them. Yeah. So there are various entry points where students are really very helpful. As an expert in higher education,
how would you uh, how would you suppose students can carry on with their education even during this pandemic while at the same time improving the health outcomes of the community? So the first premise that I would like to take is that students everywhere are the same. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd, I'd like to add you that while universities are currently not open, students in their own way have kept learning both known and unknown things. Since most of our students are on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. So for example, WhatsApp, one can read their messaging and even teaching and learning material. When you talk about, we can talk about information, communication, technology and learning. We can talk about computer-assisted learning. When you talk about ICT, people forget phones. Most of our students are on, on mobile phones. And these are tools that should have been used adequately to ensure that the linkage between the learner and the teacher is not lost. Here I'm talking about building platforms that ensure continued, continued communication and connection between the student and the teacher, and at all levels. But another concept is, for example, you know that the world is moving towards the electronic library. You know, in one of the core aspects in higher education management is what we call the 21st century teaching and learning skills. One of the core issues that is cross-cutting is ICT. So that uh, whenever there is an opportunity to learn, the students are networked and connected very easily through available technology. When we finally do open up, we have seen that as students have been disengaged from the university setting, aren't we going to see a scenario where some students cannot return to school even when the universities are open? And as the bid to open up schools is uh, being enforced, what provisions are we putting to ensure that everybody is included and is able to carry on with their education? Usually, commonly, one would like to look at life as kind and as um, quite rewarding and as enjoyable. But we know that life has another side as well. We know that uh, life is not only about general happiness. and We know that life carries along with it many challenges. But over the time of the lockdown, some people will divert the interests to other areas. Now, therefore, will be students who look at COVID as an insurmountable challenge for a student's life and then divert to other things. So I predict that some students could fall out. But nevertheless, human beings are resilient. University education will continue. But now for, for the situation of COVID-19, there is need for extra preparation and extra demand. Teach, learning is a human right. Learning is a natural process. So I think nothing whatsoever should stop learning. Yes. And ideally nothing stops it. When the top curriculum is not moving on, other things fill that space. True. Unfortunately, some of those things are hazardous. And those who will fall to the hazard might end up by being substantial. I'm thinking about the girl, the young ladies who might fall to the ploy of Ari marriage. Think about the challenge of early pregnancy, unwanted pregnancy. Think about the boys who might be swayed to go instead into making money rather than develop their professional careers. Finally, Dr. Gard, uh, the universities are meant to be an institution of innovation, research and evidence sourcing. Uh, as the universities have been closed, what are the provisions for actually uh, generating information because this pandemic but when universities have been closed, that, that input in getting information was limited. Yes, it is true that great universities are sources of um, knowledge and social enlightenment. But now that they have been closed, there are, other, you know, there are also research organizations. Many of the bureaucrats in the ministries and in the government would have passed somewhere in school. And at the helm of those organizations and the ministries, will be people who have passed through university. So that a few universities such as Makerere have continued to do a bit of work. I also know that, uh, that Mbara University has tried here and there to do bits and pieces. But what you are saying is that universities are able to and should have done more. Yes. And so there I agree with you. What you are asking is a wake-up call 
that should, we should wake up, engage in research, providing answers, reopen slowly, build think tanks, you know, build a network of research institutions and universities work, working together to find these workable solutions to mitigate uh, COVID-19 and other similar illnesses. I am Dr. Sabjin Peter, the District Health Officer. When we first reported the first case in the country, our risk perception rose and it reached a climax somewhere. Everybody knew about COVID and how dangerous it is and everyone was alert, including the community. But with the time we have seen it calm down and because of that, we see people behave differently. My name is Rose Mugindo, and I am a senior lecturer at the Mara University of Science and Technology. We jumped into the national bandwagon to, you know, like to be involved and to be part of the COVID-19 um, preparedness. We formed four main teams, four main peers, and these involved um, IPC, that is Infection Prevention. Um, surveillance, case management, and then also we had a team that was doing the screening. So each of these teams was meant to play out certain roles. For example, as a regional referral hospital, we were anticipating to receive as many cases if at all they were in. So from a, a public, uh, public health point of view, we needed to have the sub county committees set up, activated and empowered to work. Their work was to engage the community and mobilize them. And the community was very vigilant. You would not come from wherever and settle in your house without being reported to me. Many other responses, many other interventions must have a multi-sectoral approach and a well-coordinating body. The task force at the national level has coordinated and they have done their work very well. The district task forces have done the same and the response has been good. What are the main role of the students volunteers at the hospital? Yes, thank you. So the main role of the student volunteers is the when patients are coming into the hospital for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. On entry at the gate, the students are the ones managing the screening points. They are supervised mm -hmm. by um, senior people. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they will ask anyone who is accessing the hospital to go see the questions. Mm -hmm. And then they will decide whether this is highly likely or highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. Because in case of doubt, then they can also consult. Mm -hmm. But also because you need to keep data, so we have two teams literally. There's also a data collection team, a student team also. My name is Masha Yusei. I'm a PhD student I'm called Ninshawa Jacob. I'm a fifth year student of medicine and surgery. So Jacob, what motivated you to volunteer at the hospital during this novel global pandemic? Uh, before we before Uganda declared a state of emergency, we were reading about COVID from other countries. We saw in some countries final year medical students being called into action because their medical systems and facilities were overwhelmed by the numbers of the sick people. There's no point of me going home to protect myself, yet this is the kind of line I chose. It's the kind of life I'm going to lead for the rest of my years, so there's no way I could look back. Another reason was I wanted to learn something out of this. Everything that happens, there's, there's always a learning point. Personally, what motivated me to volunteer? One, I wanted to get what it feels like to manage or to be at the center of where pandemics are being, are being managed from. And then the other benefit would be like being at the center would expose us to the full personal protective equipment, the donning and doffing. Donning is, donning is putting on how those equipment are put on, then doffing is removing how they are removed. And it is not just a matter of putting on the movement. And again, here at the center, you see there are very many consultants. 
some, somebody felt it was safer here compared to going to the community where everyone is anxious. So how was your experience being at the front line? Because clearly as someone who is screening, you are the first person that possible positive patients meet. Yeah, one, it calls for a lot of carefulness. You have to be extra careful because you don't know the person you think that maybe this person does not look so sick. It could be the person who is actually carrying the virus and is going to give it to you and you give it to your colleagues. Two, uh, you have to be able to understand the people you're working with. Some of them, they don't have any idea about what's happening in the world. They know there's something called COVID-19, okay. but they don't have much knowledge. So you should be able to explain to the people what, you, what you're doing as a person. Uh, because sometimes people come and they have no ideas about protecting themselves. They tell someone to wash their hands and they look at you as an enemy. Yeah. So c can you describe how a day at work is? Uh, so usually uh, we are divided into groups. Uh, there are groups that were given accommodation around and there is another group that comes from their homes and they come to work. So usually in the morning by 7, the group that sleeps within the hospital premises mm. is always at work mm. up to 10. Then by 10 a.m., those of us who are coming from outside, we are expected to be on, on our stations. Then we run those stations from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. in the evening. Then the group that stays around comes over and covers the rest of that time. And uh, usually we are given breaks in between. If I work today, the next day I don't work. And the reason for that is that it minimizes on my chances of exposure. Okay, at first I was really not necessarily involved in the screening of patients in the hospital. We had what we called a call center. And the hospital had two phones. We were mainly involved in picking phone calls from the community. And people would call us and give us a suspect. And then we link with our surveillance team, which was which had a vehicle that was on standby. So if someone would call that I'm so and so, I'm reporting this person that has traveled back from Dubai on this date and then the surveillance will go and pick them up. So when patients come um, at your station, how do you handle them? What are the procedures that you follow? Uh, one, before you enter the hospital, you have to be screened. And to be screened, it goes through a process. You, we have to maintain social distancing. Everyone has to put on a mask. And the way it's done is that when people are going to wash their hands, it's done in lines. So those lines were meant and they are at one meter apart. So one person is always standing one meter from the next person. So they have to follow those lines, wash their hands for about 20 seconds with soap and running water, and then continue in lines where they meet the screening officers. They take their temperature, ask them some questions concerning their health and any other risk factors related to COVID-19. And also we are supposed to make sure that whoever comes has a mask and they have washed their hands. We admitted our first case on May 17th. So from May 17th to date, we've had a total of 31 patients and also discharged quite successfully over 25. We've also been able to, to do capacity building because I must say that previously for other outcomes that we've managed, we used to have really small teams we have at least up to 22 people plus on the case management team, mm -hmm. which for me is a big bonus because it shows that at least we shouldn't even have any more less ready. Mm -hmm. As a regional referral hospital, we are also mandated to look after the, the lower health facilities. Mm -hmm. So we've also been able to participate in trainings at district hospitals and lower health facilities. And also, we also have to appreciate that um, the cases have been really mild and stable cases. We did well, really, in preparing ourselves. Yes, we have had those community alerts. The community, the community has been very vigilant at the beginning, and we have worked with them. We have traced people. We did not have already built, established quarantine places, but we worked with the sister sectors. Mm -hmm. For example, for Mbarada, our quarantine facility is, still is. 
in a farm school. We recently had a local case right in a student hub uh, at Mark. How was it uh, taking care of this particular case? And in the end, uh, once the case had, had recovered, preparing the community to welcome this yes. recovered situation. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant question. The last few days, even our staff knew we didn't have a uh, most of the meals come from Tasso Village. We buy things from Tasso Village. Uh, so it was a big scare. But uh, this lady, thankfully, okay, before she had been detected, she had symptoms. And actually, she self referred to come and get a test. And she insisted because initially we were going to take a sample. Because you know, sometimes you're like, ah, not, I just want to test. And those days, particularly, at that time, we didn't even have enough testing strips. So you sort of want to save what little you have to use it for the right patient. But Amelis is not insisted. She's like, no, I'm not leaving here until you test me. Because prior to that, she had a sore throat and fever. The biggest nightmare was yes, some students are being brought up to me with our family. But, um, Thankfully, none of the students came out positive because, of course, they were worried. But it also shook us a bit, it shook the community and us and the team to remember that we have to continue being vigilant. Now, her resettlement moment was another issue because, um, of course, from that Tasso village, I think we screened up to 15 of our contacts, 50 plus, and none of them were positive. When you know that you're about to discharge a patient, you need at least about three to four days ahead of time to just go start working with the local authorities. Um, so you have to do the community education and tell them that so and so is going to come home and they will be safe. For her, I think that you have this nightmare was will people ever come back to my family and they want to make them without this kind of business. But we we were successful in preparing the community. That class will be there. And they are sent off. We have checked on her from time to time she's okay. Being a community member who basically um, stayed around her home, how would you assure she got infected with COVID-19 given that all her contacts who are actually more mobile than her weren't positive? That's a tough question because I, I don't, I can't for sure admit myself mm -hmm. to see where she got the disease from. Um, it's hard. I mean, people know their movements more than others. I mean, they didn't want to go in that direction, but it remained a puzzle. It was the same. It remained a puzzle to us. It remained a puzzle to maybe her family also because even her, her husband and her child was with her. Was also negative, so I don't know. Ah, Just now, college. One week, Panjango in the proving if it is true. Hey, Ya <laughs> 
ngo manya ngo twakera ati si bihimba niyo ni atukiza nane nyama yo kuryo murundu gumwa ni atukiza kane nango nyo nandi yo wanje ni mbasa kurya ne bakora gira kusinga ukuza ku mukaranti no abashaho nango bakabi ni mitu nurundu bakureberaje bakutwazaje aba bakande eto mu moto ka bamfise wa ah tikajita aho ka bantu bamwe na bamwe bakabanza harahaba bimbatiye eh araba bimbatiye na bamaranka nke nko kwezi kona batakizere bakumanya ngo eh hataka turwaza kuri ko bagome inteka teka ngushana haryo nabanda bari nkanye nabe bakwasirika so na kuba ku Whatever we didn't have one, but that's it. On what you're saying, because as the country is uh, responding and focusing on COVID-19, mm. don't you presume that there are other emerging health inequities as investments and mm -hmm. focus is given to the I know. pandemic? In the task force, we, we, we presented other needs. At the time, the hot issue was the pregnant woman, a mother in the labor and, 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 and uh, any person with medical a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. So for us as Mbarada, we quickly put together an ambulance team that responded. And, and we, we facilitated that team. Such a thing, in my view, must not now be thrown away. Mm -hmm. But you see, the sustainability. That's the biggest, the biggest question. Then there the, are the patients with the chronic infections, patients who are in uh, our HIV clinics. We instructed the health workers. We said, please get a register. You coordinate it, emergency refill. And we went over the radios and asked people, if you are locked down in a place and you don't have medicines, you don't have this, go to the nearest facility. Introduce yourself, tell them. That helped. There was a seamless ac access to services, even amidst the pandemic. So, as 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 um, as we were responding to the suspects and the community alerts and all that, other services went on. So, amidst all that, uh, what challenges have you faced? Uh, challenges. My sister. Resource, resource, resource mobilization. Resources, especially the consumables. And people were using masks, they were using the disinfectants. Now, these are items that you consume. So, as you use them, you have to have a plan. In a day, you consume 150 masks. But the replacement the, the, is the, the replacement is maybe 20. So even if I'm being used in a mask at midnight from the outset, I was so so worried. With this disease, I mean, we've done other things. We've managed cancer, brief body fever. You know those other hemorrhagic fevers that you mm. worry. But this particular one, I wasn't very well. A respiratory disease I've had. And you know how it started? If Americans go on TV and start crying, okay, and the Italians are crying, I'm like, hey, so if they are not managing, what about us? What about us? Yeah, so it was scary. I must say it was, it was scary, but we were doing it. At times, the patients themselves were a bit not aggressive, but it's hard to keep up. Man or woman for 14 days plus when he has no symptoms at all. So that can be challenging for the healthcare team because I mean, they'll ask you what am I doing. So that's been one of our challenges. Um, Dr. Samuel Malin, I'm a specialist in psychiatry. Um, Professor, how has the pandemic affected people's mental health? In Uganda, the immediate thing that was uh, prescribed by the president was to lock down the country. So when, when you look at these restrictive measures, they impacted on the population 
seriously. In the process, many people lost their jobs. Uh, children were now at home with the parents most of the time. And that is another um, aspect. And then access to care was also restricted because you're staying home, there's no public transport, it became expensive. Mm. Yes, and then there were frontline health workers who are directly involved in looking after the people who are sick who are in quarantine. Mm. So they were also affected. COVID-19 is a, a new disease, so we, we don't know much about its biological effect on the brain, but certainly it's there because it alters people's behavior. The worry of the unknown about COVID-19. Yeah. So you don't know whether you get infected or not, you see? So, so you're worried about yourself and the family. Then you also worried about the future, mm -hmm. and uh, research has shown that uh, more than three quarters of people are fearful and they are anxious about um, what is going to happen uh, because of COVID. Uh, COVID-19 um, has led to depression in the population. Um, depression is a psychiatric disorder characterized by a sad mood then because of, of feeling sad you find that you don't have that self-drive that uh, um, enables you to overcome uh, problems there are people who are not coping properly because of the effects of, of COVID-19 so they have restricted um, they, they have um, <coughs> responded by drinking a lot of alcohol mm -hmm. you see Yes, uh, so, and they are doing it at home because uh, there is limited movement. They buy, stock it at home, and when you drink too much alcohol, especially at home, it has negative consequences. Mm -hmm. Not just on the person who is drinking, but also on the family. Um, and others are using other substances, for example, uh, smoking cigarettes, and there are those who are abusing uh, cannabis as a way of coping. And then uh, others are using uh, what we call hard drugs like cocaine and heroin. The rate of suicide has also gone up because there are people who don't see the future. Say, what's going to happen to me and my family in these circumstances? Like the Boda Boda man who burnt himself in the petrol yes. and in the police station. There are also others who are committing homicide. You know, like you see the soldiers who are shooting people out of the blue, it means they are stressed because the, the, the government is using the forces to, in, uh, to enforce the lockdown and they are working overtime. So in the process they get stressed and, and, and they commit crimes. There are those people who have not been mentally unwell before, okay, they have been okay, but then they are going down into uh, getting mentally um, stressed but then there are people who have already been mentally unwell so COVID-19 has made their situation even worse because they cannot access care okay yeah. so we have seen people who have been mentally sick before who have not come to the hospital to take medicines now they come when they are very sick the other category are the students right from primary and um, secondary and tertiary institutions because they were sent home they are not studying now so what is going to happen to them you see they are now with the parents for a long time and the, some of the parents are stressed so they're likely to be abused at home or in the community people started to perceive and to see covid as a non-threat as it had displayed it and now this complacence has killed us. We are starting afresh to build, to put in the mind of our people that COVID is severe and it kills. Now that they have seen some death, perhaps they will believe. Yes, the economy is at stake, but you cannot have economy without life. And that is key, that must be understood by everybody. 
Now, the biggest challenge that we have, the task that we have ahead, is for us to balance, to strike a balance between relaxing the precautionary measures and the lockdown, balanced against the economy. The big one is that most of these patients were big, without any patients. So you end up literally seeing this one needs a charger, this one needs a slippers, super So it's, you're supposed to be managing your uh, patients, but then now you're going into other small, tiny patients. Yeah, but the team that I'm leading with, I must say, is a really Number two, maintaining maintaining these quarantine centers has been expensive. Lessons have been learned during the course of volunteering here. Okay, there are really many, 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 many lessons. One of the things I've learned is the, the knowledge and the skills. The knowledge here is available because they would almost every day they would put up here in our or other canteen and then they would equip us with what is on board with the COVID-19, uh, the testing materials, the preventive measures that are already like being used uh, to prevent the disease. The other they would also would have training sessions for those how to don and go by the experts for isolation. Then once in a while we used to have Ministry of Health officials coming to talk to us. But maybe another thing that we could have benefited from this period was to sometimes go on the road and see a few patients. Yeah. I've uh, gained so many things concerning, especially more in the fields of infection, prevention and control, which benefits me as a medical personnel. I've learned so much. And uh, I know I can intervene in a few things that require high standard uh, levels of, 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 of infection control and prevention. Then also, uh, I've learned that there is no there is no person who cannot play any role. Surely, we all of us have roles to play, and just that sometimes we may ignore or forget to do, but we have roles to play as all human beings, especially when it comes to such crisis things and stuff. Yeah? Yes. So uh, what challenges do you manifest as a student, as uh, a volunteer during this pandemic? Well, as a volunteer, at first it was also anxious. Then it's a pandemic, no one knows when it is ending, then even when cases kept increasing, um, measure, lockdown measures were being tightened. People know that you're here. People think you're dealing with a patient in the You go to Tassel and go to your hostel. People are okay, they really go far away from you. They think you already see or infected with a disease. Yeah. Then the other challenge would be the motivation or what I may say, maybe the allowance here. Because of course as you're here volunteering also have other person who needs to take care of. As a student that has been a challenge, but also as a student I've been worried with. When is this whole thing ending? Because being a finalist that was supposed to end in May, and this is almost August, not going back to school, like you get these moments of no hope. Yeah. There are so many challenges. One, people don't want to know about the protective measures. They think about torturing them, telling them wash your hands with soap and water. Two, what people don't understand is that uh, when you look at how COVID has, 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 if you look at how COVID has affected people, you find that uh, out of the 90 case, positive cases confirmed, 90%, uh, let's say like 85 are symptomatic, 10, 5% are sick, then uh, another 5% they are in the critical condition. Because now when you see that you have 85% are symptomatic, it means that you can have so many people, they have a virus, but their bodies are okay. So because of that, people are like, COVID is not there, and it's a political thing, but COVID is there. If you're unlucky to fall into those 5%, you will understand what COVID can do. Outside work, uh, when you leave your place and come to work in anything that is COVID branded, mm. 
people in the society see you as uh, someone who's going to get the disease from there and you bring it to them. Even when you meet your friends, they're like, boss, keep at a distance, you're likely to cause us trouble. And maybe also another challenge, okay, something I'm trying to understand. I'm a final year medical student. In October, I was supposed to be in a hospital setting, actively mm, act, taking active roles in people's health issues. So when you tell me to stop school and go home that you're protecting me, it does not make sense. Because for the last five years I've been learning how to live in such to conditions, how to do those things. Mm -hmm. How do you tell me to go home? It does not reason out at all. So in line with all those things that you've seen, the insights mm -hmm. you've had, what uh, recommendations do you have? What, in what areas do you think we can improve as a country, as a community? Uh, well, uh, one thing I want us to understand is that COVID is not about to go, it's going to be here. But we cannot live in these tight, tight conditions. Actually, uh, some, some statistics were published that the numbers of people dying from other causes are increasing because of the strict measures that have been put in place. You cannot travel from here to here, cafes at these hours. Imagine someone getting a heart attack at 10 p.m. in the night and the cafe is on, mm -hmm. and to get someone to convince them to help you with a car and what take you to the hospital. So my, my, my ideas would be that we can all learn how to live in this new norm. We have to learn to wash our hands, we have to obey, if, if, if you're washing them for like the 10th thing, they tell you wash your hands because it's a policy, you obey, you have to put on your masks, so that as time goes on, as the numbers of people who have the virus is reduced, yeah, we shall get back the normal we used to. So amidst all those challenges, um, what possible interventions should we enforce to improve um, people's mental health during this pandemic, mm -hmm. given that even access to services is a bit it tricky is limited, now. Yeah, it is restricted. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's a very um, important question um, going forward. Individually, mental health <coughs> is good if you take care of yourself. So, so that's the start. Um, how do you take care of yourself? One is you should not get infected. That means we need to follow the guidelines which are provided. One should restrict themselves to credible sources of information so that you do not uptake things which are not correct and then you get more worried. Uh, then three is the life is about receiving and giving. So for those who have more resources than others at this time, mm. <laughs> it's good to give something or to help others. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, besides that, if you think you have a problem, you need to look for support. Um, so how do we get support? It may not be physical as it used to be, but you could call a friend, talk with them, mm -hmm. and tell them what your problem is. You can even call your health worker if you have their contacts. We have seen that as the world is trying to um, fight the COVID-19, um, other issues have been sidelined, like mental health. Yes. But we are seeing that without a healthy workforce, whether it's mm -hmm. the health worker, whether it's yes. the community, yes. then we would not launch a, a good fight against mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what institutional <laughs> changes or investments should we see in issues like mental health yes. that can furthermore mm -hmm. yeah. make our fight against COVID stronger? Yeah, um, again, I, I, I can't agree with you more mm. because we in mental health are concerned by the way in which we are neglected. For instance, during the COVID-19 response, some of our psychiatric wards have been turned into COVID-19 isolation centers. And <laughs> the patients have been sent away. It happened in Masaka Hospital. It happened somewhere in Arua, um, in Imbali Hospital. And we, we really don't like that type of approach. So one way is we, we try to appeal to them, people who are concerned, not to use our facilities <laughs> for this. They, they can use it another way some other places but to to have a good mental health system you need 
a motivated workforce. So my appeal would be the mm. Ministry of Health provide enough nurses who are going to handle, we call it the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we need psychosocial services which are available to people, you know, so that they are supported. What possible um, avenue should people look out for as they are trying to improve their mental health? So my appeal would be if you think that you are if you're mentally unwell, you need to go and see a health worker um, who can uh, assist. But there are also other people who provide care, like um, religious leaders, there are um, elders in the community whom you can approach. So people should exploit the available uh, channels um, to help them um, if there is need. Nange. <laughs> My name is Availa Nina Nyakato. I'm a senior lecturer here at Barra University of Science and Technology. Dr. Barra, how has the novel COVID-19 pandemic affected the health access of rural communities in Uganda? The pandemic came in such a way that it limited access in terms of reaching out to those who are in need. One of the things that uh, could have affected health access at the same time is that there was limited ability to build evidence from the research perspective. Mm. So that one affects you to how much can you influence. So we saw um, the, the practitioners like the Ministry of Health much more go into uh, firefighting to ensure that something good happens. So I think in my, in my view as a sociologist and, and uh, who comes into public health from the social science background, the human touch, the human face, the lived experience, how people are affected, um, is something that we needed to get in touch with. So which I think is um, limits our ability to concretely say that we have evidence. Mm -hmm. So I can say that right now, we are starting to come back to normal and go out to look for evidence. Uh, so that, I can say, is the gap and, uh, and a limitation if you are not being driven by evidence. So another thing that I would say, that health, if we are looking at health from a comprehensive, taking a comprehensive perspective, People lost their lives, they can't bring food on the table. Um, people are locked into their homes. And then there was tension. We've had stories about gender-based violence. I don't know if we can put um, 
numbers to it because things are slowly coming out but what do we know about how much gender-based violence is, 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 is happening mm -hmm. right from children to uh, the, the young people, the adolescents and young people who can't go back to school who are locked back at home we know very many people who were not even able to move from their schools to reach home when there was so some people were really away from their own homes to family members to people who didn't have homes and now they have to be forced to live with other people to the elderly so there is a um, cross-cutting effect as far as gender relations are concerned that has turned into violence. I was engaged in a data collection process. We found a girl, a 13 year old girl, who is being sexually harassed by a grandfather. The report comes to the local leader and the child says, but you can't tell, you can't tell about my grandfather, I have nowhere to go. What emerging health inequities uh, do you think have arisen due to the nation's response to COVID-19? especially affecting rural communities and through a gender perspective. When we talk about gender, it brings us to an understanding that we are trying to talk about the inequalities between men and women arising from the social arrangements that, that make men and women access or are treated differently in society because of their them being male or female. And uh, when we talk about gender, we are talking about gender roles. And, uh, traditionally, for most communities in Uganda, um, men are expected to be breadwinners and women are expected to be caregivers. And this is what we are oriented in as, uh, as when we grow up uh, through what we call socialization. When we bring out that perspective of gender, definitely um, uh, the, the strategy to prevent the spread of COVID-19 uh, by, by stopping work, by lockdowns and people staying at home, uh, social distancing and families are not are not uh, related with one another. So that one, I think, definitely affects people's roles. Mm. If you can't win bread, if you can't care, bring food on the table. So that one definitely has affected people. So there was um, a border border person whom I talked to, and and um, for him was finding it very, very, finding it very positive. He said, for example. If my wife was, didn't have an alternative income, uh, I don't know how I would have gone through this. So he re got to realize that the wife having an alternative income and she was selling charcoal, when there was a, those are some of the businesses that were left to run. Mm -hmm. So like selling of charcoal, someone would think that it's not important business. Mm -hmm. But this man found it very key. It was when his daily income stopped, his family continued to meet there their needs because the wife could work so also it, it has brought a realization that there's need to to cross over have combined effort a man and a woman both together i also met a teacher who said if the wife didn't have an alternative income around home what would they be eating so you see that um also apart from the negatives people have learned that um, there is need for um, for e for equal participation, for example, in caring for the needs of the family. We can't leave men alone to be in charge of family income and livelihoods. We have to contribute. So those are some of the, much as we're talking about the negatives, but they're poor of positive stories that have brought them a realization. But we have to remember that, for example, if a family was depending on one source of income, maybe the job of a, a man who is a border border rider so now it has stopped where are they going to get to me so that's how we talk about violence mm -hmm. so we have to look we can look for out for both positive, positive. And, and, and negative
stories in, in that. Um, uh, recently, I had an opportunity to, I, I also traveled back in rural, some of the rural districts. But the stories, especially for young people, are quite different. There's a lot of worry that very few ch children will come back to school. School dropout is going to be high. Why? Many young people have lost hope. Families have lost hope. So f young girls have been married off. Because if you're waiting to finish school, are you going to finish school? Many are pregnant. People are talking about the stories of, of, of overdose and, and pregnancy. And um, there's no access to information, for example, about contraception. Hmm? If, even if you had the information, the, the hospitals are busy dealing with with the, the COVID. The, I mean, meeting the SOPs, social distance. If you're not, uh, you're not critically ill, stay at home. Uh, the main hospitals would want to see critical cases go down. Are they, so th there is that. So many people are going to get out of school. I, in the market, parents have given the businesses to their children. The ones who are in the in the in the in the food markets and the open markets selling because now they they have got alternative support. But what are the consequences? One of the LC5 told me we push these children to school, but they are learning that school is not important. So pushing them back to school is going to be very difficult. So the the, the strategy of recovery must include those components. What recommendation would you give to the ministry, to families, to institutions that are, are rebuilding? Because now this may be the new normal. What would you suggest that they incorporate to ensure that uh, once we resume, people are able to actually uh, build their lives from where they were left off? You see, when you are in an, a war and you're returning to normal, you put in place a recovery plan. And this recovery plan, I'm assuming that it considers the state of the matters. So what is the status of issues? So that everything is put into consideration. Because if we assume that we shall just open, there are many, many people are going to be left out. Many things are going to be left out. Yes, of course, we shall come back to pick them up when we see the consequences, the underlying consequences. But for me, the only thing I'm saying right now is that it is not going to be business as usual, even with the recovery. So when we are coming back, we shall as well take stock. People are affected differently. Children will be affected differently. Um, workers are going to be affected differently. Um, Resuming our duties at work, we are going to be different. I'm Bame David, I'm working as an animal production officer. It's widely known that animals interact with humans at close range or at a distant range, or in a wild life setup or in a domestic setup. So we have these domesticated animals where people graze, people milk, people pack the animals. But we have also animals in captivity, like those who are in the zoos, they interact with humans. We have animals that have been at the level of game ranching. Uh, we have animals uh, that we call uh, domestic wild. Uh, these are like uh, feral, feral, feral dogs, cats, rats, uh, lizards, geckos, they come into the house setting and they run away back to the bush. But they get in touch with surfaces, with foods, with things that humans use domestically. Hence, they can transmit the problem. Uh, they also study, the study and research informs us that uh, some animals transmit diseases from themselves to humans or back from human to animals. But there are also some diseases that need just a vehicle within between, a host. They host the pathogens, they don't follow thick or they don't succumb to the disease. But if the human gets into in contact with the host animal, we also succumb to, to the disease. Uh, but in this uh, situation of COVID-19, 
after many many such questions or many questions has remained unanswered about what could be the origin so uh, there's no clear uh, research information or literature which says that COVID-19 virus is originating from animals. However, there is some probable source and scant information which has left some significant knowledge, uh, significant knowledge gap for researchers to, to, to bear about. It's just an opening speculation doors for research, which is evidencing that uh, there is a relationship or an assumption that COVID-19, which has been isolated from humans, with an average percent of 96%, has an origin with the sister coronaviruses. Uh, for example, like SARS. SARS is a severe acute respiratory syndrome, but particularly the SARS-CoV-2, which was also seen at some time in, in China. Uh, this was uh, documented by one of the scientists called uh, uh, Yunnan in 2013. At least he, he has uh, documented that close to 90% of SARS virus originates from bats. And yet bats interact with humans at some level. In our houses, in the ceilings of humans, there are some bats. Uh, those who are doing mines, uh, when they leave the mine holes, the bus occupy them. When they come back to mine gold and whichever other minerals, the bus are there. Mm -hmm. However, people must understand that COVID-19 does not mean it must come from a live animal to a human. Or any zoonotic disease must not come from a live animal to a human. There are also other sources of, of getting a disease transmission but associated, still associated with animals. What could be done? The most important thing is awareness creation. People should get, still get aware that there, there will be a likelihood of a higher percentage of attracting a zoonotic disease when you get into contact with animals if you are not well protected and you have not followed the any healthy related guideline. Because it is already it is still documented that over over sixty percent of zoonotic disease have animal origin. Then seventy percent of, of of also zoonotic has an origin from wildlife. So there must be a clear public awareness that animals people should protect themselves, should distance themselves uh, from those animals because they can end up getting problems. On one healthy kind of approach whereby we have, uh, we need to consider environmental health, animal health, and human health, or ecosystems health. The, the experts in these three fields, they must sit together and work together at the multidisciplinary level. They should avoid this individual discipline kind of operation because since the animal is, uh, is, can be a source of a problem, then you better stop the problem at, this, at the point of origin rather than leaving it to spill over into the, 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 the human uh, population. Uh, at this level, we need to, to understand some few terms of one health approach. Uh, we need to predict the case before it happens. Or it may have happened, then the people, uh, the experts need to respond quickly, then prevent and identify. So, if those three disciplines come together at an intervention level, then we shall calm down the spillover of those pathogens into the communities, into the human population of race. I'm Ichilet. I'm Ericana. And I'm David. How has COVID-19 affected you? Uh, personally, I would want to start with the bad side. One of my like year goals was to be in fourth year by the end of by the end of this year. But it turns out even that goal, which I thought was very assured, is not happening. <laughs> That's the bad side. Secondly, on the good side, I got a breather. I was doing uh, obstetrics. I started reading 
you know, those first months I was like, I'm going to catch up by the time. But then it turned out that I was not going back to school any time and longer. <laughs> so I, uh, I, the reading morale really went down and I should say I've not been reading my obstetrics anymore. When I stopped uh, reading, I said, now COVID-19 is the thing, now I should think about COVID-19 and what to do. The second thing, maybe I got some time to read a few books, yeah, and stay at home for a long time. Ever since I, I uh, graduated from the One Health Institute, I've not had a lot of One Health hands-on. Mm. But this time we had this activity with all these students from different backgrounds, and we're in the community doing the education, yeah, and it was a good experience for me, like seeing a problem and this time we are really doing something about it. Personally, I feel uh, COVID-19 was a sieve that took away my time. Mm. Uh, I was on surgery rotation in a medical school and I was almost getting close to this uh, chill like mode of life, preparing for the obstetrics gynecology, which would be the most tough uh, course that would take as medical students. And of course, this was all taken and it means even when I'm here, you know, there's still more battle to fight <laughs> once this thing is done. And uh, uh, looking at uh, the other negative part of it, uh, after COVID, of course, I had to go back home really. And of uh, course, uh, my parents were like, you know, I wanted to remain in the hospital practicing and they were like, young man, please mind about your life. So I went home. You can imagine three months home <laughs> and uh, really the experience of the village. <laughs> it's a different uh, perspective. But then I got one other positive side of this whole village experience because I had the time now to concentrate on the many things I work on yeah. as a student leader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it also gave me a chance to go to my real home village. Mm -hmm. And uh, my neighbors saw me hands on teaching them about mm. COVID-19. Mm. Of course, this started as a myth in the village there. Mm. Was it in English? Really, it was local language. Because <laughs> uh, these people were like, you know, there's no COVID this side. Mm. So you can imagine we left here, they had crossed the university, and you are in the village. People are there sitting together, mm. hugging, they want to greet you. Mm. And they're like, this man is not greeting us. Is it, is it because of the too much education? You know, in the village there, they believe sure. that uh, <laughs> once you have gone to school, sometimes you start pulling away different. from them. Mm. So I got hands on, I told them, you people, COVID is real, I'm here because of COVID, otherwise. Yeah, they know, I, I don't take a month in the village. So they saw me one month, two months, and I'm like, you guys, no longer joke, this is COVID. So really, they got the experience, and uh, I'm happy that they know, I, at least I started some medicine. So that was the other positive side, so anytime I go back, they know this man knows the science. And, uh, the other side of the COVID is uh, recently, towards the mid-COVID time, I had the prayer to come back to Mbarara. He had a referral to see what's happening, how is life like. And uh, I found uh, students volunteering. I gave them my one day. I enjoyed the experience, but uh, because of the regulations, I was able to go back, but I was inspired to remain around. But uh, no sooner had I been there than this whole project of student uh, COVID activity for our one health science students in the lab came in and uh, really I was happy that it found me in town because it was easy for me to do some mobilization where possible mm. and then also to practice hands-on for the first activity that we had that mm. is the sensitization in Tasso, the web corner mm. and really it was very good. Mm. Uh, maybe the other side of the positive is that uh, it's this time within the COVID that I'm trying to think uh, somewhere outside the box I can call it because it is outside the box uh, in the sense that it is not a medical school anymore. Mm. I'm thinking something, how do I sustain myself and it around me mm. through the innovative ways mm. if all this life was to remain like this. Mm. It is really a stimulating topic. Mm. I've recorded a number of things which I think if I was still in school by now, I wouldn't get beyond this time to overthink. That's true. Uh, in, on my side, negatively, uh, as you all know, I was aspiring for guild presidency at the university. Oh, wow. <laughs> and by the time universities were shut down, mm. we were left with a week 
towards election day. Oh. So we're, we're practically nearly done. <laughs> All was going well. Mm. And before we knew it, campus was closed. Any other plans that were made had to shut down. Mm. So we had to put a close on those aspirations and keep them open, of course, but they could not follow through. Mm. And then uh, I equally knew I was going to graduate by 2022. But as of now, I'm <laughs> not yet a finalist. Uh, I've not even finished the semester that I was in. So I'm not really sure when I will graduate. So I had a timeline of the next 10 years of my life. And <laughs> first of all, I had to graduate and start the next phase. Uh, but that has changed. Positively, I've been forced to, to think creatively. There are things that I would never have done had I not been forced to change my lifestyle. <laughs> like, like there was a, a serious push mm. so like now i've begun a bullet journaling it's mm. just a way that you can track your life your productivity be accountable for your habits your moods mm. so 20 years from now i can have uh, a catalog of my life i can know how i was at at, at 21. Mm. so this pandemic has given us various opportunities like now we have we have organized this response against COVID-19 mm. we're organizing the premier African documentary mm. on COVID-19 had this not <coughs> happened surely mm. we would not be here yeah. uh, we have met different people all because of this pandemic so mm. in the end yes we have lost some things but I believe we have gained some mm, because true. um I've been doing several online courses, which I did not have time to yeah, do. Me too. I didn't have time to do yeah. during the during the normal educational oh, yeah, semester. It. It's my first online course was done during this exactly, time. <laughs> exactly. So while I'm not uh, progressing in my undergraduate program, yeah. I'm actually progressing in other areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've gone into website designing things that. Honestly, honestly, I would not have done all these yeah. things. That's true. So it it has been uh, a, a whirlwind, and for me, since I did not go home uh, when yeah. conferences were closed, I chose to stick around and do a couple of activities around. So that in itself ha ha put me in a, a sense of, of, of growth. They call it adulting. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was forced to feel mature. <laughs> Guys, you have to pay rent, like you know, oh, some no. other thing. You're buying babies. Yeah. Um, anyway, what what role have we played as students in fighting COVID nineteen? As people, as men, as women, what role have we played? Okay, me as a person, one thing I'm trying to do is always remember to wash my hands. You know, when you're entering the supermarket, they force you, but when you're going out, they don't remind you. So I'm I'm always reminding myself when I'm getting out to make sure that I wash the hands and I travel with an excess extra mask. Okay, the first time why I decided to travel with extra mask is uh, when I was in a taxi, people were told to put on mask and two people never had mask. So then the next time I had these two extra masks and it turns out that every time I'm in a taxi, I have to Tell give out an extra mask. <laughs> Yeah, so so it seems like as an individual, so you, 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 you really need to have these extra masks because yes. mm. if there are yeah, the people out there, you know what masks do. Yeah. yeah. Like a week ago, mm. uh, I became part of the caretakers. My brother got a terrible injury and I've been in the hospital with a group of a community of people. So they bring in a patient, so a patient comes, no protection, no other nothing. Then it's my role, I tell the nurses, they like you people. You bring this person, they are not protected. After sending them for infusion sets, can't you also tell them to get masks on? So they are like, yeah, but you man, you have gazi gazi. I'm like, you know what? We are all here and we have patients. So these guys, we don't know where they come from. Yeah, that's true. So my seven days in the clinic have actually turned out to be a positive in the sense that when I mention it twice, the next day you find the guy has a mask. Mm -hmm. Some come with them and they first keep them. Mm -hmm. So when it come hard, they put them on. Yeah. So it's been hard, of course, I've been putting pressure on the patients, yet I'm also like part of them, I'm a caretaker, but then later they will appreciate that I really did something. Maybe lastly is that uh, regardless of the COVID, mm -hmm. this is a pandemic. So as a student, it gave me time to read about other pandemics mm -hmm. in detail, because in a medical school, mm -hmm. they will tell you this, they give you some history of this pandemic happening, then you go because you concentrate on the topic at the moment, but I've been able to read. Pray you can answer. Read the demands, yes. Mm.
to be the like, uh, cholera, yeah. to be the, the typhus, yeah. and uh, it was also helped me to exploit the iniquity that existed before in these yeah. pandemics. Yeah. I, uh, I used this time to do courses on COVID-19 because one would think that this is for maybe the health professionals, mm. the experts, but I took it upon myself to try and do courses with COVID-19, to acquaint myself. Yeah. And at the same time, I organized discussions where we would discuss different issues related to COVID-19 in a bid to raise awareness. Mm. And you'd be surprised the myths and misconceptions that people had mm. even then. Do you think um, this experience has influenced uh, what you would like to specialize in in the future? It hasn't changed a thing, but it has fallen in my right, in my right kind of line that mm. I want to follow. I want to be a physician and I was looking at two things, mastering in chest diseases or infectious diseases and this thing has come, uh, yeah, it has opened my eyes more to the lines of infectious diseases. So yeah, I think, I, I, yeah, it's taking me, <laughs> it's in my line. That's it's in your lane. Thing, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. You're welcome. And um, as a One Health student, clearly you are at the front line of what the One Health approach is actually pushing for. And we are proud and inspired by your actions. Thank, thank you. you for having us. That's how we started with the HIV. That takes me to the recommendations. Mm. So we need now to train our health workers, equip them, and give them the ability and the capacity one, to be able to quickly suspect. Yeah. So even for COVID, it's high time we started to think like that. Yeah. That we think of a COVID-19 prevention and control program. It, it's now time for us to move away from the emergency mode. We cannot continue to act in that manner. So for me, that is my one recommendation, a program. Train. And Dr. Sawatende, uh, could you tell us any highlights that you've had during this entire pandemic mm. as of now? There's one thing that I'm, I live with. At some point, I was called to pick a suspect. And they told me this man is from Rwanda and he's very aggressive. I quickly called the DPC and the DSO. They gave me a policeman and a soldier, each of them carrying a gun. At a distance, I saw the man who was not well kept, Ria. This gentleman spoke only Chinyaranda. I know a bit of Chinyaranda, so I approached him. The man turned and looked at me. And the first thing he did was to smile. Oh, I tell you that smile deflated. The smile took away the fear. And I asked for his name. The man said, my name is Juan. So why are you here? I got lost. How did you get lost in narrated history? The people who gave us information never understood what the young man was going through. And for them, they saw aggression. As a public health specialist, I came back thinking how much work we have to do to communicate and communicate the right things. So that, that is, that, that, that's an experience that I will live with. And I will tell my grandchildren about it. Thank, Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Sarah you. The, the, the theme of the documentary is the power of their story. So even just that story is powerful enough. As it's changed you, it will equally change others. So we are grateful for your time and your willingness. Good. Thank you very much. I'm glad you are recording this. It should be seen and watched by many. COVID is real and it kills. It has killed people globally, it has started killing Ugandans. Do not wait to be the next victim. My name is Dr. Grace Chitunzi Muliowa. I'm a dermatologist working with Imbarara University, where I've been working with my departed colleague, Dr. Peter Magisha Sebishimbo, a very young man who was just aged 38 years old when he died just recently, 7th of September this very month, due to this COVID pandemic disease which we have. 
Of course, it is so sad we lost a colleague, a very hardworking young man, dedicated. He has taught quite a number of students here and also in Kampala International University, that is in Mishaka. So he has been a very dedicated, well-focused worker in the university. As a fraternity of dermatologists in Uganda, we are not so many, around 20 to 25 there, we don't exceed 25, who serve a population of 40 million Ugandans, can imagine, we lost a very young and energetic, dedicated man. He was a parent, of course. He left two boys, young, one seven years around, and another one is around one and a half years, and the wife. So such a young family, it's a tragedy to them. It's up to us all to continue supporting this family. But just to give you a brief of the events which happened in the last few days, around 45 days before he departed. We were with him in the same department on 2nd and 3rd, that was a Wednesday and a Thursday the other week. On Friday, which was the 4th, we were supposed again to be to meet here, but he never made it. He only made a call and said, I'm not feeling well. On Wednesday, he had told us he was feeling some chills, you know, like you have, you feel cold. He talked of a dry cough, but it was really mild. There was nothing big about it. So Friday in the evening, I'm called that, oh, he's not feeling well. I check on him, I found him coughing, coughing, coughing. He managed to go through that Friday night. On Saturday again, the wife calls me. This guy is not breathing well at all. We contacted the COVID team. They came assessed and transferred him to isolation center here in the intensive care unit. Everything was done to save his life. Everything was available. They tried whatever they could, but the oxygen saturation due to the difficulty in breathing, kept on going down, down, down until on early Monday morning, around 3 a.m., he breathed his last. Why do I, do I have to go through this? It's just because I want to show or to tell the people who may watch some of these recordings that please, COVID is real. It is so brutal. We don't want other people to see what we saw our colleague going through. It suffocates you. It deprives you of your ability to breathe. You are in an area where you have a lot of oxygen around you, but you cannot use it. You go down as your friends are looking at you helplessly and even as yourself, you are helpless. Up to now, in Ibarra town, I'm seeing people who are refuting, saying, no, it was not COVID. COVID is not real. But everybody has his own chance to take whatever he wants to believe in. But as they continue to believe along that line of blindness, thinking that COVID is not real, one day, people will wake up to find that COVID is in their own homes and that's when they'll believe and by that time it will be too late. The only message I would like to leave with people is we should not let the death of our colleagues just go pass by without us taking a lesson. Let's learn from it. Let's know prevention is better because we don't have any cure and trying to prevent this disease is really upon each and every one individually. No one is going to do it for any other person. One has to do it himself. We know the standard operating procedures. Let's follow them. Masks are important. As I speak now, we have already been tested twice. Those of us who were directly involved in managing the late Dr. Peter Mugisha. So far we have turned negative to tests. 
but I believe it's because we had masks on all the time we were handling him because at first we were not using any of these PPEs which are specifically meant for COVID but all the same the masks I believe are the ones which saved us so please follow the guidelines listen COVID is brutal we should not let the death of our colleague just go in vain. May Peter so rest in I will conclude by saying uh, thank you to our dear collaborators, most especially Makere University, Oshaya Country Office, Afrofun, you said University of Minnesota, University of California, Taft University, and so many others. We appreciate all the support that we have gotten from you.